welcome to the reality revolution and i'm super excited today we have kristen johnston uh kristen johnson or is it johnston johnston with a t with a t kristen johnston mm -hmm. you have heard of kristen if you watched the interview from kyle boyd where he talked about his spiritual journey and you've also seen kristen in the uh uh, meditations that I've done with the Quantum um, Health Collective. And uh, I'm super excited to talk about Kristen. She owns the Quantum Wellness Center and is has lots of knowledge on the stuff we talk about on this channel. So welcome to the Reality Revolution, Kristen. Thank you, Brian. I feel really honored to be here. Well, thank you. And so um, it's, it's exciting in this day and age to see an entrepreneur, somebody that's uh, seeing what's happening in the future and the expansion of consciousness and you're you're a business person that's that's taken that and expanded and used your business to help others collectively and also using the quantum health collective so uh, i wanted to get your story on your own spiritual journey and tell us a little bit more about how you came to this point yeah that's that's a loaded topic because it wasn't exactly something that i had anticipated or planned you know right. um i never saw myself as as a business person or someone who even wanted to move in that direction but i always was a mystic you know i was always chasing mm -hmm. the mystery and um you know spirituality just made sense to me as soon as i was in like as soon as i was introduced to that that path of sort of spiritual seeking and and like-minded spiritual community it just clicked like it just made sense and i think um my life has kind of just unfolded step by step almost like i'm like picking up breadcrumbs as i go you know it's like these little clues are left and somehow that sort of led us to you know my family and i and 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 my friend circle it's kind of like led us here but i can't say that it was like an intentional step by step plan you know right. um it's just been following following the mystery right uh, was there was there some moment in time when you had a realization about Actu consciousness in general? That yeah, so if if I go back to like around 2008, that's sort of when this right. awakening started happening for me. Um, I I was sort of struggling in my life. I had a pretty long-standing opiate addiction, and mm -hmm. that's when I started to realize that I, like I needed to shift something something within me needed to change the sort of like the suffering that I had experienced in my life had grown so great that I, I actually wanted something different. And I picked up the book, The Secret in, um, in Borders and reading that, I can't say, it wasn't like I learned something new. It was like, I remembered, like right. I remembered that information, like, oh my God, like my thoughts influence my feelings, my feelings influence my vibration. It was like, I remembered this wisdom and, um, and that was like this big awakening for me. And it really like, it woke me up, you know? And and I had recently started studying Reiki and, and then I found my way into an energy medicine mystery school where I studied at for three years. And um, I actually assistant teach there now. And I got plugged into a community of, um, of spiritual seekers. And for the first time I wasn't, like, I wasn't alone in my seeking. You know, I wasn't like mm -hmm. in my parents' basement, like reading book after book and just like loving the wisdom. I was, I was plugged into a community of like-minded people who were also reading the books and they were experiencing the magic. And um, that was sort of like uh, the seed was planted that I'm going to do something like this with my life. I, I couldn't have figured it out quite yet what right. it was, but I knew like I could feel it at that point when I was in that school, which was in my early 20s. Right. Well, tell me a little more about the energy. I'm totally fascinated by all, all the mystery schools. One of the things I, I love to do is um, go check out different mystery schools because there's some amazing groups out there that hold and collect certain kinds of knowledge that we don't even talk about on YouTube videos that um, is truly mind blowing. Uh, and so w was it an, an initiation process or, or did you become an apprentice or did they reveal it? How was it when you started learning when you went to that mystery school? So um, it's really interesting because I, I just found my way there one night, like by a series of synchronicity. And I, right. I walk into this room and there's these people and they're playing crystal bowls. And there was this, like, I just felt like I was home. You know, there was this feeling right. of like, I'm, I'm meant to be here. And I signed up immediately. I had no idea how I was going to come up with the money. I just knew. <laughs> 
there was just this like, hey, this is going to work out. And right. um, so it was it was a series of weekends and you would and each weekend was focused on a specific ch- uh, specific chakra. And so it would be like, you know, root chakra weekend. And we'd really dig into the programming around that energy center and and how we manage that energy. And so it was really like self mastery, you know, and, mm-hmm. and so it wasn't really an initiation, um, even though it was it wasn't. Uh, it's very hard to explain because it was really right. this sort of alchemical process that happened just by being plugged into the school. And um, we did we did a lot of hands on healing work. Um, the, the name of the school is um, the Reese Thomas Institute of Energy Medicine, and it's fully right. virtual now because of everything that's going on um, with COVID. But back when I attended the school, it was all in person. So we did a lot of meditation work. Um, and there was there was a lot of techniques. It was really like um, I learned a new language for the soul, and that was really transformative. I started to understand um, sort of like how how consciousness works in in different people, if that makes sense. Right. Different soul constitutions, I guess. Like I learned a language of soul profiling, which was really profound. It helped me in my relationships tremendously. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's actually based off the work of Wilhelm Wilhelm Reich and right. Alexander Lowen. So I don't know if you've heard of oh, um, yeah. like, yeah. So the the school that was really the um, the core of the school was a combination of um, Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lowen, and then Carolyn Meese's work, and mm-hmm. um, and Anodea Judith, and just really like all of these brilliant authors and the synergy. And Reese Thomas is. Um, you know, he's my teacher, Reese Thomas and Lisa Campion were my teachers and they were just phenomenal, right. you know. So you're like a wisdom really tradition. working with Oregon energy and, and beyond that, but Reich was working with Oregon energy kind of, right? Yep. Um, yep. And then the transmutation of energy. Uh, wow, I could just talk to you forever about that stuff. Uh, yes. People have a sort of misunderstanding about chakras. Even when I talk about it on my channel, uh, they think it's a place in the body. Mm. It's not right. It's a. It's 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 almost another universe that's within the field of our body, but it's not a body part, right? Exactly. Yeah. The way that um, the language that I learned around the archetypes were the they were these basic like levels of consciousness, right? So right. if we think about like root chakra consciousness, then we're looking at okay, that's your you know your physical body, your base, like the slowest vibrational energy in our density is form, right? It is right. matter. So that's how I how I look at the root chakra is sort of like what is the form in your life, right? What are the what's that level of density? And then as we move up in vibration, right? Like mm-hmm. feeling or emotion has less of a density to it. Like we can feel it, but we can't quite touch it. It's not matter, it's something else, you know. And then as we move higher and higher, we raise that frequency up until we're experiencing pure spirit, which has right absolutely no form at all now have help me to understand if you know because for uh, i love that you've read these authors your personal experience with other energy centers beyond the primary seven there's some people that use a 13 energy center um modality some use a 20 some work with the nadis and, and there's all these other energy centers people talk about the tree of life and how the the energy goes all to our hands and so you know with your you know, wellness center and everything, um, you might've had one, firsthand experience in seeing other people work with these energy centers. So help me to understand beyond the, the very generic idea of the seven chakras, what else? I mean, are there chakras outside of our bodies, inside the body? Tell me what you've learned about it and how you, if that at all has applied in your life. Yeah, you I'm, I'm sure. Here? I, uh, totally. I'm sure that there are, you know, th- like you said, with so many different lineages, there's all these different um, ways of interpreting energy. Right. Um, I think the easiest way, because humans complicate things, you know what I mean? We get exactly. so heady and we take something that's so basic and we, we, we just complicate the shit out of everything. Um, so I personally, I really like, um, like the seven chakras are a great blueprint for understanding the full spectrum of the human condition, right. because really... I've come to understand that like that's what I'm here to learn about like I'm here to understand how to human you know and and I spent the (laughs) first um the first half of my journey trying to get out of being human it was like very uncomfortable um I really wanted to avoid it 
And so understanding the chakras in the most basic sense of sort of like one through seven helped me understand, okay, these are the basic building blocks, the basic le like levels of consciousness that I need to navigate in this reality. Right. And I'm sure that, you know, there's infinite other realities and infinite other dimensions of consciousness with all these other chakras, but I could, I'll spin out thinking about all of this right. stuff. And so now I'm realizing, okay, how do, how do I, how, how do I master my experience? Right. And also have faith in the mystery of my experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I think there's a duality going on. There's a, there's a masculine perspective that says, I need to understand how the engine works. I need to understand all the little dynamics. There's the feminine, which is always more powerful and accurate, which is the instinctual, just this system, it works. Don't worry about it. Just follow the feeling of it, right? It feels totally. like that, you know, there, that's why, you know, I, I, you know, and you had mentioned it, we uh, talked about um, the, the, uh, the energy system with Drinvala Melchizedek and, and working with all that. And he's teaching a sort of masculine way of looking at the energy system with the Merkaba and, yeah. and how it wrote, but there's, that's for those people that need to have that complex understanding. And really you don't, right? Yeah. You don't. There's a you, divine intelligence that helps us that knows already. Oh, and it's, and that's the part of us that like the human part of us really has a tough time with that. It, it the does. human, yeah, the human in us wants to know, wants to control, wants to predict, wants to like have mm -hmm. everything just so, but like the soul, there's this infinite wisdom within us that if we can just kind of drop into that place and into that center, there's also this deeper knowingness that says, I don't, I don't need to control this. As long as I'm in alignment with my soul and my energy is flowing, what's right. meant for me will find me. And that's like one of the biggest takeaways. Um, there's another author that I really, really love. Um, his name is Stephen Kessler. And yes. he, he writes um, The Five Personality Patterns, I believe is his book. And, and he talks about the energy flow and how different people direct that flow of energy. Right. And how, what really happens is like, when you think about when we're little, right? When we're babies, we come into this body and we don't see ourselves as separate yet. We are this infinite field of energy that's sensing and feeling and it's intuitive and it knows, it knows things. And then what happens is the more we grow accustomed to this density, this earth density, we start to restrict that energy flow based off, like usually it's pain. It's like painful experiences will we'll restrict the flow of our energy just like fear will restrict the flow of our breathing. And then that's restricting the flow of our energy. And what happens is we grow accustomed to these defended states. And then, and then that's what we consider normal. And we walk around our adult lives in these like, you know, hypervigilant defenses, trying to protect ourselves from the painful experiences that we may have endured in childhood. And right. so then we've got all of these defended adults. And then we, we don't, we don't realize that we don't understand love the way we did when we were younger because right. we're no longer a flowing field of energy. We're like this rigid control freak about reality. You know? I love that. I love the way you describe that. It's so true. And when you're going back to what you said about learning to human, uh, it's really kind of a learning how to think and create. Uh, and it seems like as I learn more, uh, I, there's also, there's also sort of a, I, I'm I'm creating much faster and faster, and there are consequences to this. Like there's it's when we're when we're the baby, it's we're seems like we're protected. Everything is flowing mm. so naturally. So now when I think something, I have to really take responsibility for every single thought. Right? We didn't have to do that when we're babies. As we grow older and remember more, there's a sort of a greater responsibility in the power of our thought. Totally. Does that, Absolutely. And if, if you think about the word responsibility, right, it's like our ability to respond. It's like we, <laughs> we become conscious of how we're responding to life. When we're, we're little, we sort of absorb these reactive programs. And it's like we just react to what happens. Right. And then as we become conscious or as our, as our consciousness expands, then we, we become aware that we do, have, we do have control, but it's not over what we think think or want to have control over mm -hmm. what we have control over is our is our thoughts 
and then and then we we realize what we think about we bring about and so there is a responsibility that comes with consciousness and that i think that responsibility is over over our minds and over our emotions which then dictate our actions right right now kristen is one of the founding members of the quantum health collective one of my favorite things and I have this vision, I have this dream, and I know that you know what I'm talking about. Because um, uh, I've been to AA, and I know how those meetings work. And anybody that knows about AA, you can look up in the phone book, and there's an AA in every community in every city. And I have this vision. That there's going to be a QHC in every community, in every city, right? And that would be amazing. Because it'll be a, a group setting that's similar the way you guys work it is beautiful. It's similar in that group setting where everybody's kind of sharing knowledge in a unique way, but it's not about addiction and what I did wrong in the past and overcoming or making amends for. It's about this learning and blossoming of, of our own knowledge, which I, you know, I'm calling out to everybody who's watching this right now. Let's create a group so that every single community out there, people can look up in their phone book and there's a quantum health collective where people yeah. are coming together for the expansion of consciousness in these groups together, right? And you're yes. the, you're, you planted a seed. And I know that Kyle texted me that he had someone contact him and saying, asking about opening a QHC in Texas or something, right? So um, cool, yeah. Can you, can you see, tell me about your vision with the QHC. So <laughs> that was one thing that I just felt like there's so much power in the collective conscious community, yes. right? Like, just like, like our individual energy field is incredibly powerful. And then when we sync up with someone else who's broadcasting that same frequency, it's almost like it amplifies that, that sine wave that we're sending out. Right. And if you get big groups of people together, I mean, we see this with like mass meditations and mass prayer that it, mm -hmm. it changes the nature of our reality. So Kyle and I, we, you know, we both had sort of like initiation by addiction, right? right but addiction right. for for me, that's just what it was. It was it was my initiation into this healing work. I don't really claim it as a personality trait, or right. it was it was an experience that that I had. Um, but I I also went about healing from addiction in a very different way. So Kyle and I linked up, and and that was sort of we both had this love of this work right? This like mm -hmm. this coming into consciousness, this responsibility for what we're creating. And also this like this magic that happens and the mystery when you're when you're living in those harmonious states of being and, and love, right? Like high vibration magic right. happens around you. And we were just so lit up about this work that we're like, let's let's start this group, you know? And, and I had been right. thinking about that for a long time is this work changes people's lives. Like my life it was like alchemy. I, it was, it was a mm -hmm. purification. And then, you know, you end up with this really like this really pure spirit that has the power to, to change lives. And so that's really like the, the foundation of the QHC was really about like, like minds and like hearts who love the, the, it's like the mystical path, you know? I really believe strongly that the, the next level of evolution for humanity is a sort of group mind consciousness. I know that you've read about the law of one, the, the social memory complex that forms. Napoleon Hill way back talked about, you know, you know, think tanks where people would get together in groups and for business purposes, right? And, you know, even the Bible, Jesus, whenever two people come together in my name, right? It's like, mm -hmm. there is this thing that happens when multiple people come together that is beyond a single person. And if we can form groups all over that are working together, meditating together in groups, it, it, it starts to become what's the, what would it's it's like a, it'll multiply faster and faster and faster it's really the key for us to collectively move our consciousness to the next level and with that we with covid it doesn't matter we can get on zoom as a group we're still it's not consciousness is non-local right so we w when 30 people are together on zoom talking about or interviewing a subject or talking about or meditating uh, it doesn't matter where you're at, right? A, a field starts to form, something happens. And you've experienced afterwards the effects of this, right? There is a, there's something that happens beyond if you're sitting in your house just meditating to a Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation. And then when you do it with a group or talk collectively about an idea, right? 
Yeah, I think there's just something so magical about being being like seen, felt and understood for that level of soul within. And when spiritual people get together over that common thread of of really a desire to bring more love into the world, right? Because if you if you love something, if you love your work, it it creates this wave. And and I think if we can get more groups of people together who just love that's that's really what it is if you right. love science and you're with a bunch of other people who love science you're all broadcasting this high vibration of like we love this or if you love art or if you love family if you're in love if you're in the vibration of love people are gonna feel that you yeah. know and and I, for me that's it's always it's just about love how do we how do we bring more be more do more love right what is so awesome, it's so nice to meet somebody that reads like I do, that is like just constantly acquiring information. And like you said, it's a remembering, but still there's this deep yearning for knowledge. I know that you're, we've, we can already tell with what you said. Is there a book that you've recently read that really blew your mind um, that I need to check out? Oh, geez. I, so... <laughs> There's so many, like books are like my thing. They're, it's almost like you get to hang out with all these different authors, you know? Right. And that's what I like, cause they say you are who you surround yourself with. So I surround myself with just author after author. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, I guess it depends on what we're talking about. Like Eckhart Tolle is a, he's just, you know, a new earth changed my life. His book, A New Earth, I read it once a year. Um, and it's just, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. But you know what's a really fantastic book that not a lot of people um, talk about is The Undefended Self. The Undefended Self, Fear No Evil is another really good one. Okay. Um, those, are, those are deep. They, they get really deep into the, the human psyche too. And sort of like, the, like you said, there's a duality going on when it comes to being human. We are... We are um, we're both, you know, we're, we're light and shadow. And Very so much. I love, I love shadow work. I love that integration of, um, of the human part of us, which was, I think really what I resisted for so many years was like this, this human. And now I see that that's really where the fun is. I love the spiritual stuff, but, you know, think about the, the heart chakra, right? Is like the median between the upper three and the lower three. And that's really that 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 harmonious place between who we are as as humans and as spirit. And so I think that there's a necessary piece of um, doing the doing the shadow work, doing the the human work. Um, so what's there's another another phenomenal book, The Dark Side of Light Chasers. Have you read yes, that one yet? Yes, yes. So good. I think that I read that author passed away. Yeah, um, Debbie Ford. Debbie Ford, right? And and that mm -hmm. book is just so and, and coming from such an interesting perspective, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, because we all talk about light chasers and and you know, uh, it's I, I I think it's mandatory reading for anybody that's talking about the expansion of consciousness and light in general, yeah. right? Yeah, so, I think it should be. It, it should really be. should be. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so easy to go into that spiritual mask, right? Of like, oh, everything is everything is love and everything is light. But we right. still have this this human part of us, you know, so it's like integrating, integrating the shadow and bringing it into consciousness. Right. Uh, and obviously, when 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 you've in integrated that much knowledge and, and read that many books, you, you um, are starting to work on your own book. So I wanted to get a little bit of background about that and tell me what, what you had a story to tell. Um, what, what, were you, what were you writing about right now, Kristen? Yeah, so this is actually one of the most profound stories of my life. It's something that it just sticks inside my consciousness. It, it really, until I finish writing this book and deliver it to the people, it, it's one of those things that just won't go away. Yeah. Um, I, what I did to heal from my addiction was I journeyed with a powerful um, psychedelic plant and it's, it's called Iboga and it grows in Gabon, Africa. Mm -hmm. And I just knew because I had done all the, um, traditional approaches to healing. I, I, I went to AA meetings and I got on all the medications and everything, mm -hmm. but I was really, um, I was in my second year of this mystery school where I was learning to follow my spirit and my soul. And mm -hmm. I heard about this plant and my soul was like, that's your medicine. And I, I tried to ignore it for like, you know, six months, but again, it just wouldn't go away. And so I ended up finding my way to journey with this plant. And I saw many things, um, while I was journeying with Iboga. 
And but the most profound thing that I saw was the cover of a book. And, you know, it was this yellow paperback cover and these letters um, just appeared on the book and it said HTP. And what's strange is I was in my second year of HTP healer training program. Yeah. Um, but the book didn't spell out healer training program. It spelled out heal the people. And this crowd appeared around the book and they were chanting, heal the people, heal the people, like louder and louder until I actually sat up and I looked at my provider and I said, I think I just saw the first book I'm going to write. And you no, know, mind you, this was like nine years ago. And at that point, I, I didn't even know how to heal myself. I was just really figuring that out. And so I've right. spent the last nine years like figuring out, okay, what does that mean? What does it mean to heal the people? And, and so that's really what, what the book is about. And, and it's sort of like this fusion of everything that we're talking about. Like, how do, we, how do we integrate being human, but also being these divine spiritual beings who are immortal? And how do we merge those things to bring about a shift in human consciousness? You know? Amazing. So I can't wait. Put me on the list. Send it to right. me. I, I definitely want to read. I can't wait to read it. So, um, so you have the Quantum Health and Wellness Center. It's in Massachusetts. In in what? Which? Where is it? In we're in Seekonk, um, Seekonk, Massachusetts. Okay, that's near yeah. Boston. So I don't um, know. It's we're probably about forty five minutes away from Boston. Okay, all right. Yeah. And you you offer a bunch of things. I was looking on the website, Lucialite, and you have uh, um, some you know different meetings and and meditations and and so tell me a little bit more about what you've been able to offer through that. Yeah, so that again was, um, it, we call it quantum because it really was a, a product of these meditations and this sort of surrendering, the surrendering the individual will and merging it mm -hmm. with this divine will. And um, it was really quite a surprise. So that's a story for another time, but we, we do offer, um, we do meditations, we do group meetings. The Lucia light has been incredible. I have seen so many profound healings using that that technology um, for people. So that's been incredible. But my favorite thing, honestly, is, is having a space where I can bring in some of my favorite teachers and healers and, and then they teach classes. So right. we're always having, we're always having different stuff. Um, just an incredible, you know, like we just have such a beautiful community of conscious people who have a desire to be of service to the world around them. And so we're all like, we're all heart centered people just helping each other out. That's amazing. So you've had a lot of guests on the QHC and people that have spoken at Quantum Health and Wellness. Tell me about one that really lit you up that was, you know, some some uh, guest or something, something that you learned <clears throat> because it, it, you've, le you've had so many people that you had the opportunity to, to question and ask. Um, so, you know, is there anybody that, that I need to know about that I might've missed? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. There's, there's been so many people. There's been, yeah. there's really, it's, it's almost hard to pinpoint because there's really been is. so many incredible people. Um, it, you know, actually I, I really love, I think you would dig my teacher to uh, Lisa Campion. She uh -huh. just came out with a book. Um, she's actually got two books now, the okay. art of psychic Reiki. Um, so she grew up as um, like super psychic, you know, she was just seeing things that other people weren't seeing and um, she's really like mastered her craft as a, as a healer and, and a psychic. And now, her, you know, that's her, that's her deliverable is she helps other sensitives and empaths manage their energy field and develop their psychic gifts so they can, um, you know, be of service to others. So she's, she's pretty rad. And uh, she's been a huge mentor for me and helping me develop my gifts. And I think she's, she's worth checking out for sure. Cool. Now you, you, you have done Reiki. Um, so tell me a little bit. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Um, I've met some people that are Reiki healers that are just almost superhuman. And I, I still find myself wanting to understand it completely. Um, tell me about your path with that. And have you seen anything miraculous? Um, it, it, tell me, just help me to understand. You understand? Uh, you, I, 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 Reiki could be one of the most profound modalities for healing and consciousness raising, but there's a certain mystery about it that's that's entailed. When you know, you know, when people try to explain and talk about it, it's experiential on some level. And so, you know, whenever I talk to somebody that's that's been involved in learning it, um, give me some aspect to just a, a civilian to help understand the power of Reiki. Yeah, I think again, it's like one of those things that's like being drawn by the mystical, like, 
I remember being young and my cousin had gotten into a car accident and she really messed herself up. She broke her pelvis and all this. And um, she was working as a hairstylist in a salon. And apparently mm. a woman came up to her and said, you know, did you have an injury? And, and so my cousin's like, yeah, she knew this stuff about me and I didn't know how, but she asked if she could like lay her hands on me. And she said, I felt this heat coming off of her hands. And she said for three days, I didn't have pain in my hips after that. And I remember being young and thinking, what was that? Like, what was that 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 lady did? Like my soul had mm. already known that that would be like, a path I wanted to take and then so that was probably when I was like you know 16 or something and then a few years down the road my friends my friend starts telling me about her mom who's a Reiki master who does this hands-on healing stuff and her hands get really hot mm -hmm. and I uh, that same feeling I was like I gotta know I gotta know what that is and I asked her her mom if she would train me and so she gave me a Reiki attunement and you know nothing really spectacular changed instantaneously overnight but it was my initiation into mm -hmm. this mystical path where you're almost picking up breadcrumbs along the way and um i have i have seen amazing things happen that you really you just can't explain it, right. it like logically or rationally you know i remember there was one night um, I had just learned Reiki and I was studying and I was holding this crystal in my hand and, you know, I went into meditation and I had this vision of my mom and my mom was laying in a hospital bed and she had this lump on the left side of her breast mm -hmm. and in the vision and I'm holding this crystal in my hand and in the vision I take this mass from her chest and I feel it go into this crystal that I'm holding. And I remember coming out of that meditation thinking, whoa, that was like really strange, you know? And at this point, I didn't know anybody in the energy medicine school. I'm kind of like on my own with this stuff. And I went upstairs and I asked her and I said, mom, um, do you have a lump in your chest? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And she said, I haven't told anybody about that. And um, wow. when, she went, when she went back to the doctors, they couldn't find it. It, it was gone. And so that's not the only, I've seen so many things like that happen that you just learn, even if you can't explain it, mm -hmm. you can have faith in it, you know? And to me, that's, that's the mystical path is having faith in the unseen just right. as much as you have faith in the seen. So how, how do you deal with dreams? Let's talk about that. I mean, that I love, I would love to talk about that. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that, say that, that what does this dream mean? Or, or I'll have a dream and, it, you know, and I, of course you've read a lot of different ways of interpreting dreams. Um, and so there's, there's tons. I don't want to add my voice to it first. I want to get your, how do you go about interpreting your dreams? Or when someone else brings a dream to you, what is your first instinct or how do you, what are dreams to us? What do they mean mystically? You know, dreams, um, I love this because I'm always analyzing my dreams. Right. And, um, and actually, Lisa Campion does a phenomenal sort of like dream talk, which which would be awesome to listen to. But my perspective is that different dreams are different. And you'll you'll notice by by how they feel like for me, um, sometimes I'll just have dreams that, that kind of feel like a mashup of like, you know, like what happened the day before or something I thought about. And I don't give those a whole ton of, um, I don't give them a ton of space. Like it's like, oh, that was sort of just a dream. But then I have other dreams that are not just dreams. And I know this by, because I'll wake up immediately from them. It's almost like it'll be a visitation from somebody or it'll be, um, you know, it's kind of weird, but I've done a lot of um, like releasement work in my dreams. Like people will come to me in dreams who have these negative attachments or like dark energy attached to them. So mm -hmm. I do a lot of shamanic stuff, but I only tend to do it in dream work, but I'll always know the difference of that dream because I'll wake up immediately from it. And it's usually at like three o'clock in the morning. Right. So I think there's like, there's an energy around like paying attention to the emotion behind your dream. Cause if, if you're really, really scared in the dream or if it's really emotional, I think that there's probably a piece of like our human that's attached to it, but the dreams that almost feel neutral where you're just observing it and you're watching something take place and you're not really emotionally invested. Like, I think, I think it's more about just paying attention to, to that right. for me anyway. I get it. So when I'm dreaming, I continuously have this dream where I've lost something 
all the time. Like, you know, I, I'm, I lost my keys and I'm just spending hours looking for my keys or, uh, you know, I'm, and I, you know, I'm still, I don't know quite how to, um, but anyway, that, you know, there's, uh, I'm sure that we, we could all just go through different dreams and interpret them in different ways. Yeah, well, think but. about the seeker, right? Like you've totally got a seeker archetype. Probably. Like yeah, so if you think about the, like, think about, that's another thing I love is like Carolyn Meese's work around archetypes. Mm -hmm. it, it's just profound. It's like learning another language. And think about like the the seeker. The seeker is like always like looking for that thing, you know? Right. I didn't but think I about that archetype, but that's great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So it's like looking looking for that key, looking for that, that you know, because what right. does a key do? It, it unlocks. It mystery, unlocks, right, right. right. No, yeah. archetypes... Um, you know, I think a lot of people misunderstand astrology and the tarot because they're trying to predict some future. And I really think that what those are getting at deep down is we are all made up of these archetypes, all of them, all of those archetypes, you know, the magician, um, all of them, the, the fool, they, and they all mean something. I think that we're going to collectively come to a point where we integrate these archetypes. There's going to be an understanding of visualization where all of these archetypes make us whole. This, I've had this thought a lot. It's talked about in the law of one literature. And since you mentioned archetypes, what is your impressions of that? <laughs> Actually, what you said, I never thought about it that way, but that it does make sense. And it's right. almost similar to like what they say in the Course in Miracles about the atonement and the separated sons. It's like right. maybe at some point there will be this reemergence of, of all of the aspects that make us what we are as humans you know right. maybe there will be some merging back into oneness at some point i mean wouldn't that be great right we're going through obviously being human is just constantly going through states you know there's the the there's constant it's just you know that it's states and so each one is just an experience and, and we imagine if we reached a point where we were all the states at once Mm. that's a different kind of oneness it's a singular oneness but it's a oneness of all those archetypes we've collected them all and we realize it you know like you said the shadow work where the shadow is a part what is one of those archetypes it's a kind of a coming to a realization of who we are as a whole we've because we're just only able to go into that one state there's something a power something else that will happen once we re reach that point right yeah that's um i can't remember the author's name it's russell um, he writes a book called From Science to God, and he kind of explains no. that. Oh, I would have to look it up. It's Russell. I don't know if that's right. his first or last name, um, but he he was a uh, quantum physicist who, you know, studied really, really early on, mastered sort of like the, like, just brilliant, like beyond right. brilliant. And he Sounds wrote this familiar, book. Yeah. You may you may have read it. It's It's called From Science to God. And, um, mm -hmm. and he kind of talks about that sort of like the you know, basically when, when we all come together, what comes next out of that next stage of evolution is something it's like the, you know, the, right. the whole is greater than the parts, you know, it's like something completely new that comes out of this, this awakening. And I actually see what's happening in the world today as a necessary part of this awakening, mm -hmm. because it's bringing to the light of consciousness some of the aspects of humanity that have been shoved in the shadow and so it's if so we true. see it that way you know if we see it that way as like hey this is a teacher this is a great teacher for us um and we don't resist it and we don't try to push it back down into the shadow but we really say okay what is this coming up for what am i supposed to learn from this experience then we can use it as fuel for transformation as opposed to you know, believing that we're somehow being punished by the current state of humanity or or to, you know, be further driven into this division amongst men. Like we're really, right. we're here to unite, you know? Right. If it's, I, I try to role play and game plan. Imagine if we woke up and we had the memories and thoughts of everyone on earth. That we would go insane, right? Mm -hmm. We would go insane, but maybe, maybe we're moving towards that, but it's super slow. So there's a point where, uh, we, we start to see it. We see it in the world. We see the, we see the shadow. We see the divisiveness. We see the part of us we, we claim in our heart. We would never be that racist person over there, that hateful person, that evil murderous person. We wouldn't, but we're seeing it. 
when in the past, like you said, it was something that we threw away, we would ignore, and now it's just in our face, right? There's going to be a point. What if you knew the secrets of all of your of your your friends? I mean, what if all of your secrets became available to everybody? How would you deal with that, right? Mm. And I think there's a, we're going through this middle phase where we're kind of preparing ourselves for that. <laughs> if that makes everything, it seems in nature to be slow. So, it, you know, the plant grows very slowly. We're reaching a point where I'm going to know all your secrets. You're going to know all of mine. If I knew of all of them now and you all knew all mine, you'd be like disgusted. I wouldn't want to talk to you, right? But there's going to be a point where, yeah, of course, that's how everybody is. We're going to see the shadow in everybody and we're going to be okay with it. Our hearts will be open to it and understand it, right? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think so. I, I, think th I think there's like, um there's this meme on the internet and my because my husband's shown it to me a bunch of times and right. it's like these aliens and they're like looking at humans and they're like why don't they just use telepathy and that you know the alien said oh because they have too much to hide from each other exactly and maybe maybe that's why we don't have telepathy we are subconsciously stopping it from happening yeah right? well because we're we're afraid of our own shadows that's mm -hmm. literally what it is and so then we project them onto other people and we judge them in others and we reject mm -hmm. them in others but so much of what we reject in the world outside of us is like a part of our own selves that we've we've hidden or we've we've judged it in ourselves and we can't allow it to come up we're not willing to look at ourselves and say it's okay true. where do i do something that's similar to that and how could i have a willingness because if we can see it and forgive it in ourselves then we're going to be more likely to see it and forgive it in someone right. else you know, one of the most cartoonish examples of that is when you see the homophobic pastor that turns out to be homosexual later on, right? The one that's yeah. all hateful and angry, but then later on you find out in some news report he was caught and, you know, and he's in trouble or it's always somebody accusing somebody of something that of being terrible of that they do themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what they say. If you if you're pointing a finger at someone else, you've got three more pointing back at you. Exactly, exactly. You know, so. so it's like I always check myself and say, okay, if I'm if I've got that voice in my head that's like judging someone else, um, I've got to be willing to look at, okay, where's the piece of me in that? You know, and sometimes it's a genuine curiosity. I had one of my friends is um, a really good therapist, and he said, you know, if you're genuinely curious, like if it's just a curiosity, if you're like, oh, why is that person that way? Then there's probably not a whole lot of your story in it. But if you're like, if you're pissed off about it, if you're charged up about it, you got to look at yourself in that, you know, there's your trigger is there. But if it's right. just curiosity, then you might just be really wondering. But if you're pissed, there's a reason. And I get a lot of emails from people that have gone through this recently with politics or even famous people, and they see somebody that they they hate. And I'm, Brian, I'm a loving person, but this person just, it, it just triggers me every time. What do I do? And I'm the same way. I'm, I'm, and I'm responding, hey, I'm the same way. I'm having a hard time with this as well because I, yeah. I can't help but see this particular person or thing or whatever. Um, and it, it is, I have learned from it. I've learned how do you love something that you hate? How, how do you find love in situations that are disagreeable? Yeah, it's a learning. Sometimes, you know what's awesome? Um, have you ever heard of Byron Katie? Sounds she familiar. Wrote, she wrote the book, Loving What Is. And she's got this whole um, worksheet around it. Go through so this whole like, interview and write a list out now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that books are like, that books are my thing. But yeah, Byron Katie is it. phenomenal. It's, um, it's called Judge Your Neighbor. She has like a Judge Your Neighbor worksheet. And you ask yourself this series of questions. And right. what you end up finding is that um, most of the stuff you're pissed off about is just like a story in your own head that you've created. And there's a way to turn it around so you can diffuse the situation. And sometimes sometimes you can't love a situation but right. you can come to accept that you can't love it and then and then you diffuse the the resistance or the tension that energetic dissonance of not being able to accept something sometimes you just have to accept that you're still pissed and right. and that you know but at least i learned that at least i learned that it was able to deal with it without creating fear in my heart it's it's a it's a battle of understanding fear and like we said how to be human how to think everything that we're talking about is lessons we've learned maybe other people are at the beginning or middle stage of it where you're learning how to think how to be human because learning how to think and create i feel like these are lessons that are super important for later on maybe in another uh incarnation so 
what is the point of it all? Are we are we in a classroom setting on this earth? Are we moving to what is that? What is your theory? Because obviously we don't know for sure. But I know that you deep down have a theory that you'd love to talk about of what is our purpose? What's actually going on in the universe? What happens next? What is your what's your theory? <laughs> oh, it's it's I think about this stuff all the time. And it's it's such a good question. It's such a good question. Sometimes I think that we we are here. I think I think there's opportunity to learn, right? In every right. situation. But but are we are we here to learn or are we just here to be, to experience, right? Like right what if we're here to be human and that what if that's it and i'm not saying it is but right. what if it is like what if we're here to because there was a time where i was extremely rigid about my diet and i would only eat raw food and because right. i liked that it made me feel really euphoric and really connected to spirit but I, then i realized that like i wasn't connected to my body I wasn't even grounded because all i was drinking was like green juice and i was vibrating so high i felt like i was on drugs but like, what if, and then I realized, well, what if I'm here to experience the pleasures of food? What if we're here to experience the pleasures of sex? What if we're here to experience the pleasure of being powerful, of having an ego, right? There's so mm -hmm. much sort of like Eastern philosophy of like, oh, we're here to transcend the ego. What if we're not? What if we're here right. just to experience this experience, knowing that it's not permanent? So there's right. that Buddhist philosophy of impermanence. And then we can, and then we can relax into it and not make it so serious about, well, I've got boxes to check off or I've got soul lessons to accomplish. What if it's all about being present? What is your impression of the, the Buddhist philosophy, which I think is misinterpreted, but when you first start learning about Buddhism, every, the life is suffering. Is life suffering? Hmm. I think <laughs> life, I like, so I, I thought about that a lot. Um, I think that like life is, you know how they say dukkha, like unsatisfactory. Like mm -hmm. I think that life can be unsatisfactory. Um, but I also think that it can be bliss. Like I think that it's everything. I think that it's, I think that that's it. We are here to experience the duality of it. Cause if we were pure spirit all the time and we didn't have contrast, like why would we come to planet earth? Like why right. wouldn't we just stay in the ethers where, where there is no duality and it's only love. I think we're here. I think once you remember that love is your eternal nature, then you can be in your impermanence. You can be in your impermanent duality and you can say, okay, I'm here to experience this duality. It doesn't mean that it's real. It doesn't like what's to me, what's, what's real is what's eternal and that's love. But what's temporary is what's real right now. And you have the power by, by taking responsibility of your thoughts, you do have the power to, to kind of like manipulate your experience in that way. Right. So I think like suffering, life is suffering until you wake up. Right. You know? I would agree. I mean, I, but I, I would not make the focus that life is suffering. Life can be suffering. Yeah. That's my, yeah. that's my own impression. Obviously yeah. um, for people watching it, I'm, I'm not claiming to be right. I'm only claiming my own experience of this and my own impression of it. Totally. And so it is fun to talk about. Yeah. And who so, wants to claim suffering as like the eternal truth? Like who wants to claim that? Right. I don't want to claim that. I don't, you know. There's always, there's also this in, in spiritual circles, this discussion of the afterlife. Is there a heaven and hell? I was just watching a video before I came on and this person was saying, well, of course there's a hell and, you know, there, and, and eternity is not long enough for the punishment that we deserve to be humans. Um, mm. And so <laughs> and I was like, you know, my own impression is that we create our own hell, that we create our own heaven now and in the future. Um, but there's, it's a spiritual thing, this discussion of some sort of afterlife that is demarcated by a heaven and in a hell, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you there. There's another book, um, Dying to Be Me, Anita um, Morjani, if you want to talk about the afterlife or about the experiences of leaving the body right. and then com coming back into the body. Her story is amazing. She's Trump. actually coming to the Quantum Healing Collective. I will have to check that one out. Trying to be me, you said? Dying to be Dying me. to be me. Yeah. Very yep. cool. She actually, she actually died and, you know, like stage four cancer died left her body, touched her soul 
and then made the decision to come back knowing that the body would heal itself because she remembered who she was at the level of the soul. So it also oh, transcends wow. this, oh, it's phenomenal. Her book is phenomenal, but it transcends that, that belief that we have in the body's ability to heal. Like one thing my teacher always said was like, if you touch your soul, you can heal anything because the soul has never had an illness. The soul has never had a problem. It's always your human that's struggling in this dimension. You actually have a book club. Yeah. I saw that on your face. You have, a, a, a which would be very exciting, uh, which is a great idea. So, somebody that's re reading that, right? Reading yeah, we just, we just started it. We're on our first book. Because I've been saying this forever, because I read so much. And yeah. you know, I've, now, now that we have Quantum um, and the Quantum Healing Collective, I've got so many new friends who also read. Um, I'm like, let's start a book club. And so we it's finally did idea. it. <laughs> Yeah. And so that's what we do. We just read books and we just talk about, you know, these different philosophies because right. thinkers love to think. So you guys have some amazing guests coming on the QHC. Bruce Lipton. Can't yeah. wait. That's going to be amazing. And I'll probably post this on Thursday, but we're going to be doing a group meditation on Wednesday. So I will post that on my channel. Um, we're going to do group quantum surfing. Uh, you know, so I like to also ask at the end of this, you know, I want somebody that's been through the process, that's constantly reading. You have studied different daily rituals, right? So what are you at now? What works for you? What's your daily habit and ritual? When you wake up, when you meditate, what you eat, give me just a, you know, an outline that's really worked for you that may help me. I like to try to steal people's daily rituals that are spiritual like you. I, I do love, um, I, I probably could be better with discipline around rituals. I'm not the most disciplined. I kind of right. like. But maybe that's intuitive. not a good thing. There's a, I've come to the point, maybe, maybe not having a daily ritual, but a certain guiding goal. I don't know. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think meditation is incredible. You know what I mean? I love the right. cold exposure. That's been something we've been doing recently is like doing mm -hmm. the, the ice tubs. I can't say I do it every day, but that's been, I think just anything you can do to overcome yourself and the voice that wants you to stay comfortable. Um, right. You know, and, and nutrition for me is like always such a big thing. I notice a big difference in my consciousness when, when I'm eating really clean and my body's really clean, my mm -hmm. consciousness is really, um, it's really elevated. And when I eat foods that have certain densities that maybe are like, you know, poor quality foods or suboptimal foods for the body, um, I notice that. So I would say nutrition, meditation and yoga those are my rituals. When you meditate, how long do you meditate? So I used to meditate for a really long time. I'd meditate for like, I'd do like the long Dr. Joe meditation. The 90 every minute. Single, oh, yeah. Right. oh yeah. Every single night, like the pineal <laughs> gland one. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I've had some mystical out of body, like really crazy experiences doing those meditations, but I also have a family and I've got businesses. So <laughs> those long meditations don't, don't always serve me. Um, so it just depends on what I've got the time for. Right. But it's true. Well, you, you reach that uh, almost addictive level. Like, I really want two hours of straight meditation right now. For some people, yeah. when I say that, it sounds crazy, but I get that. Totally. But uh, like a minimum of 20, 20 minutes, maybe? Or do you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends too, though. For someone who's really just, you don't want to discourage people who've never meditated in 20 minutes feels like an eternity. It really So does. it's like, but if you start at, say you just start at three minutes and then you do five and then you do 10, all of a sudden 20 goes by like that. So it's you, like you do yoga about at. once a week or yeah, I used to do yoga every single day um, before, you know, before the whole quarantine thing happened and we had a routine where the kids went to school and I would do yoga and meditate every morning. Right, but now right. the kids that were doing virtual schooling. So we're like around the kids all the time. Um, but I try to do it a couple times a week because I think similar to what we talked about with uh, with Wilhelm Reich and the Oregon energy mm -hmm. yoga isn't designed necessarily to be a physical practice it's an energetic practice it's it to really unite is. the body and the soul and and to restore adequate energy flow like we talked about the baby that has the infinite field of energy that then becomes rigid and restricted yoga through the power of breath and movement restores adequate energy flow to the body and when the body has energy the life gets really balanced and really organized and it's pretty magical what happens when people manage their energy. I've been trying to do like with my yoga, I've been doing a lot of 
headstands just hanging upside down. <laughs> I don't know, but it's something that lately I've noticed has been kind of cool. But um, so everybody needs to check out the Quantum Health Collective, Quantum Health and Wellness. And Kristen, thank you so much. It's such an honor to speak with you, to learn so much, to be with and talk to somebody that loves books and knowledge as much as I do. And you are an honorary forever member of the Reality Revolution. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to have you on it again. We'll talk about this stuff soon. Please let me know when your book is out so I can promote it and let everybody else know about it. And uh, welcome to the Reality Revolution, Kristen. Thank you so much. I had a blast. Thank you. Well, welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm just really excited today because this is the first day that my book is released. This is it, The Reality Revolution. Worked on this for a very long time. So many of the things that I discovered along the way and I was excited to share it with everybody. tell you a little bit about it. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I'm interacting in the world and, and starting to realize that my thoughts created reality. As I did this, I started to see some major shifts in my reality. I started to explore the idea of maneuvering through parallel realities. I'm your host, Brian Scott.